Good afternoon, everyone. This is Brad Schreiber calling from Elko, Nevada. I'm ready to put on the Mountaineer 2 Sizer webinar. I want to thank everybody for, for joining in here this afternoon. Uh, there's, a, there's a photograph of myself there. I'll just tell you a little bit. I was uh, the Mountaineer size product line manager uh, for about two years with Pennsylvania Crusher, and now I've moved on to uh, become the Eastern uh, U.S. and Canadian sales manager for, the, uh, for that territory there. Um, I was kind of involved in, in things here with the uh, development of the Mountaineer 2 uh, from the Mountaineer 1 machine, and uh, we'll go and talk about a little bit about several of the uh, advantages of the new machine and, and some general things about the Mountaineer Sizer. Here's a little bit of a little bit more overview about the history and the advantages that we do have with our timed rotors, which is a key function and uh, features of our of our equipment. Um, some of the applications that we've been into with the coal, minerals and other specific applications that we have capabilities of, of doing. Um, some of the cross-references between and comparisons with sizers and roll crushers. Some of the different teeth that we put on the, on the sizers there for specific jobs or specific types of minerals or materials. Um, the features and benefits that we have of our, within our machines. And uh, the newest development, the independent modular link gearbox. Uh, which is a, a feature uh, only found on the Mountaineer 2 sizer. Uh, there are construction and our easy maintenance for this newer piece of equipment. Um, some of the custom things we can do for our customers and then show you some features there about the, uh, about the machine itself. Um, our, our caption here is when proper sizing matters. And in proper sizing, it is a very important concept that we have really taken stock in and we took and configured our machines because of the fact that when you have the proper sizing, all of the rest of the material handling and processing uh, equipment downstream to make your final output product uh, is enhanced with having the proper size material. So as the rotors take and turn towards each other, we utilize uh, timing gears in, as you can see down in the area here, um, uh, with the modular link gear box that we have that provides the timing, uh, we have that as a secondary standalone piece of equipment here in our drive chain. And here's uh, a little bit of an overview and a cutout showing the two independent spur gears. Here's a little history that we've, uh, I'd like to present about the Mountaineer Sizer. We started up making these particular units in, in 2003. We developed uh, from scratch our own sizer. One of the things we wanted to do is to take and put it onto a common base frame. And so since then, we've built uh, 68 of these machines in Ohio. Uh, concerning our domestic and worldwide sales, we've um, got about 60 of them. We'll be in operation uh, by the end of this year. And we still have sizers, about 10, uh, that in our sec first year of, of uh, selling the, the units that we still have in operation. So the life and longevity, even of the first generation, has been very successful. Uh, we're vertically integrated. Uh, we're building these in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. And by vertic being vertically integrated, uh, we have uh, very good tolerances as well as very high quality, which adds to the overall life of the, of the machine. Talking a little bit about our timing and the rotors, our advantage. Um, having proper size is, is paramount in order to take and eliminate slabs and having top size control. When bringing the plant, the material into the process, uh, processing plant, pumps and other screens and other uh, particular types of uh, separation technologies that they use in the plant operate much better by having the correct size and particle distribution. Um, we also are involved in uh, the reduction of fine uh, and increased by the screening effect. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but what it allows us to do is to allow the material to take and fall through the sizer itself if, in fact, it needs no further crushing. And uh, we screen out some of the smaller material, let it fall through the gaps between the rotors with the timing technique, 
and then uh, uh, reduce less fines by not crushing additional materials that do not need crushing. Uh, we can produce a cubic product since we're bringing in and timing the actual teeth into themselves, into the body of the adjacent roll, so we can provide a cubic product with this time technique. And we're increasing our efficiency with lower wear and horsepower requirements. This is a little bit involved with the screening effect and not crushing material that we do not need to need to crush. Um, some of the coal mining and, and processing, these are, are some of the app coal applications that we uh, have been very successful in, uh, in the coal mining and processing. Uh, some are, were uh, basically center sizing, uh, where we would take and take large run of the mine material, coal and rock, and we would go from 1,200 down to 150 millimeter is, is basically the size range in which we uh, size the materials. Um, so we have center sizing for also for clean coal products or maybe direct ship products where the material is not going into a preparation plant, comes directly from the strip site and uh, is, is crushed and immediately loaded into into trains uh, for specific power applications. So in those cases, we've been very successful uh, down to 40 millimeter um, in, in size. Um, we also have been in, involved with mineral applications besides coal and clean coal. Uh, we've done um, gypsum and limestone and marl materials. Uh, these are relatively um, soft and, and friable materials that we've been able to take and do a very, a very reasonable job on with low, uh, low wear rates as well as, as very reasonable production rates. Uh, we've done some soft ores, uh, nickel ores, um, and different types of agglomerated materials, uh, uh, loosely agglomerated gold uh, deposits. Uh, we've also done some different types of filter cakes and concentrates where the lumping and certain chemical bonding take place after the concentrate is made and it needs to be taken and broken back down uh, to, uh, to be you know, further processed or leached. Uh, we've been involved in the salt industry, so we've done cakes and, and other precipitates, uh, pond, solar pond uh, types of applications where we've uh, you know, brought material back in and um, homogenized it and reduced it in size prior to um, frost flotation and other mineral processing techniques. Um, we've done some sandstone, shale, and overburden materials where these materials uh, need to be further uh, processed or put back into specific landfills or, or different filling or compaction techniques where the material needs to be uh, more homogenized with uh, smaller particles. So. That gives us a, a, hopefully a, a pretty good idea of you know the broad range in which these sizers can uh, can be efficiently operated in. Here's a, a few more. This is kind of a list of, of some of the uh, the of the applications that we uh, have been involved with, or you know in some cases we have not been involved with, but are very good targets for the mountaineer sizer. So we've, you know, we talked about our coal. Uh, there are some construction materials involved in the production of cement clicker, clinker or uh, clay type materials involved in brick making and other types of applications. Uh, we've also been involved with the um, industrial minerals, uh, borate or borax ores, chalk, uh, kimberlite, and, uh, and some work in the oil sand area. Um, there's other types of uh, mixed medium or strength ores uh, that we mentioned there. Gold, nickel, silver, and copper are some uh, different types of sulfides that are friable enough and have low enough compressive strengths that the sizer is uh, suitable to handle. Uh, we have a few miscellaneous applications where spent carbon anodes from the aluminum processing, uh, petroleum coke, and other overburden processing applications. So uh, I think what we're trying to show here is there's a design, a uh, pretty wide range of applications we can design specialized teeth for or size a particular machine 
to, to, to provide, uh, you know, the kind of output and, and longevity that the customer and durability is looking for. One, one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit here was I think was important is uh, there are sizers and roll crushers, and they do look quite a bit alike, but they have two, uh, two rotors that are, are driven differently, but actually rotate together. And so there, there are some differences in how these machines are configured, uh, built, and the, the typical applications that they use them in do have overlap. However, um, there is a lot of preference for the sizer when we get down to uh, torque and, and drive components and, and so forth that uh, customers do like to have and uh, were more appropriate that the, uh, the sizer might be over the double roll crusher. Uh, the sizer rotates at about 25 to 100 RPM and it's typically slower than the roll crusher uh, up around 250 to 350 RPM. What it does in that comparison is that by rotating small lower, uh, we have a little bit less capacity with the sizer. However, we do get a little bit better screening technique, as I'd mentioned, to let material fall through the roll gaps and not be crushed. So um, they do rival each other from the standpoint of capacity, but from a pure theor theoretical standpoint, uh, the 250 to 350 RPM machine would, have more, would make more material just due to the Physics of the ribbon flow through the center gap of the of the uh, of the rolls at the same output size. Uh, physically, the rotors have been continuous shafts. Um, one and then uh, then basically uh, uh, sh uh, sh um, hubs or or bolt-on segments are put on uh, the continuous shaft and and then um, for that particular construction. Uh, the double roll crushers uh, typically use like a uh, shell, uh, thick wall mechanical tubing, and then stub shafts are, are taken and welded into the ends uh, for to make up that construction. Um, they do have a lot of flexibility uh, to uh, to take and uh, utilize different types of tooth configurations and so forth uh, for both machines. Um, the last thing that is different between the roll crusher and the sizer is that sizers are typically direct drive by the double roll crushers are driven with shivs, belts, and then sometimes flywheels when you have rather large pieces of material that need uh, extra energy uh, or momentum to take and be crushed. How does the sizer differ from a roll crusher here? We're getting back into a few more different aspects of the machine. Uh, as I mentioned, sizes are typically lower capacity than the uh, double roll, just due to the RPM. Uh, we also have sizers have significantly higher torque characteristics. Um, we sometimes with the roll crushers utilize the large flywheels for additional momentum. Uh, but the sizers basically on their drive configuration and the turn down that they utilize with the uh, uh, large um, gear reducers uh, will provide much higher torque. Um, sizers are not typically equipped with trap metal relief and, and they can jam under load. So sometimes, uh, you know, we do get materials that get caught in the machine, will cause the, uh, the rotors to stop. Uh, they can be reversed. Not at all times can the can the rotors be reversed to take and remove a piece of tramp metal. Uh, with the double roll crusher at Gunlock, we do have a very efficient means of taking and uh, passing trump tramp material. Uh, this slide shows uh, you know some of the teeth that we are able to take and provide on the uh, for the for the sizer. Uh, up above is a, a bolt on type of cast tooth uh, with having a Brunel hardness of over 500. And then down below, we have a fabricated welded tooth uh, that, uh, of an astroloid construction and hard face uh, to provide very rugged durability in those cases. Some of the economics uh, that we have and the versatile features and benefits 
that, that we have for the Mountaineer sizer are the, uh, the timed rolls we talked about for the better size control. And this can be ideal for the run of the mine or secondary types of material processing. So we can set these up machines up and they can be uh, reconfigured um, as required uh, for different tooth configuration or different output sizes, which makes them very flexible. Um, we can size some pretty hefty material with the, uh, with the Mountaineer sizer, up to uh, about 25,000 PSI in compressive strength. Now, we can also accept some very large lumps of material. Just depending upon uh, the capacity and so forth, we can get up to almost a 60-inch, 48 to 60-inch piece of material in the throat of the, of the Mountaineer II. So we can handle some very large top size. Um, our, our design, uh, basically, with um, you know, we're sandwiched in between a feed chute and a and a discharge, so it makes it for a, a very nice uh, economic uh, fit, as well as very air, environmentally uh, sure uh, from the standpoint that you know, basically, we can bolt to the top and the bottom, and just, uh, keep from um, any types of dusting and and so forth with the uh, normal slow speed operation. Um, our rotor teeth, we can take and, and change out with the bolt-on configuration in a very quick fashion. And these can be done, uh, you know, in a matter of shifts. Uh, we have a proven uh, worldwide installations, and we have quite a few of these machines, over 40 in China. We've done a very good job in taking and supporting these machines with localized warehouses and trained um, technical staff to go out and assist the customer. So we feel that's a pretty big advantage for us. Uh, we talked about the timing and, and the independent spear, spur gears. The entire um, gearbox can be changed out relatively easy. We can take and work on the rotors without even connecting, uh, excuse me, disconnecting uh, the gear couplings uh, on the drive side, and so it gives us a very modular approach to taking working on the piece of equipment without disturbing and having to realign other components and sections of the drivetrain. This uh, shows us uh, an overview of the uh, of the Mountaineer. Uh, one thing that here is that we have is is, is the unified construction and base. This allows us to take and put all of the components and align all the components easily onto the, onto the unified structure. So if we want to take any one particular component loose, whether it be the motor or the link gear box or the gear, gear reducer itself, or take one of the rotors out of the um, crushing chamber, um, any one can be pulled out without disturbing another. We have uh, one of the features we talked about here is the optional torque limiting coupling, is that we have the capabilities to take and put in several different types of torque limiting devices. And what this does is help if, in fact, you get a severe jam within the um, crushing box and stopping of the rotors rather quickly. It allows us to take and uh, transmit that energy back to the torque limiting coupling and letting that go and uh, pop off and, and reduce uh, any chance of that being transmitted back to the gearbox or to the motor. Uh, the gearbox and the gear couplings are very robust. That's why we feel putting the torque limiting coupling in the position is, uh, will make an optimal place for uh, limiting that torque. These are some of the uh, benefits that we have and, and methodology to, to utilize uh, the, the ease of uh, maintenance on this. And we have the uniframe construction, uh, which really makes it nice. We can have the entire unit pulled off of a truck, set into place, and, and hoisted up into the plant uh, without disturbing anything. So it's, it's pretty much plug and play once you take and uh, uh, offload and, and uh, uh, get the unit and bolt the unit in place. Um, off the shelf standard parts, uh, we utilize uh, uh, for our unit. Uh, the couplings are all standard gear couplings, Falk or, or other manufacturers, as well as the uh, gear reducers uh, can be specified by the customer for 
uh, you know, service in their area or what kind of brand that they are familiar with. Um, by bringing these link gears off of the actual rotor shafts, it, it's going to increase the dependability and make a much tougher design. Since we're not utilizing a tapered fit, a tapered shrink, we have these, we have a larger shrink area, we have a stabilized linking gear box, which, which definitely provides a, a tougher design. We're, we're, we're looking at and, and continuing to explore more trap metal protection technologies and features uh, for those catastrophic types of jamming techniques. Everybody experiences them. Sometimes they, they do more damage than other, but we want to take and be able to set these types of devices so when we have the most catastrophic uh, failure point we would anticipate, then we would allow these devices to uh, take their place and, and take the shock and uh, allow it to be easily reset so you can go back on your way in production. We have some custom types of things that we can do for, for, for any, any particular machines, uh, depending upon the volume that you would like, uh, the number, of the, the type of um, uh, materials you would like to handle, um, where you have maybe tough, tough uh, trap metal types of contaminations that would be involved, or you do have uncrushable, other uncrushable materials, or you have specific ores that require um, certain types of cutting techniques or, or, or different types of bit configurations. So we have a lot of different types that we can utilize, and we normally just work with the customers required to, uh, to do those. Um, this is the last sheet of the presentation. This really kind of shows uh, some of the technical data that we have concerning uh, the different series of machines that we have. Um, we, we start off with our 5,000 series machine here, uh, then we move up to our 6,500, 8,000 series, and then ultimately 10,000 series. What, what this allows us to do is to take in uh, larger top size, as we can see here, our maximum top size about 30 inches or 750 millimeters. And as we take and spread these um, rotors apart and become have larger distances between them, we'll go up to uh, 30 inches, 40 inches, 48, and then up to 60 inches, allowing us to take and grab larger top size material and have larger throughput through the machine. Um, we also take and have balanced out these larger maximum feed sizes the amount of material we can put through the machine uh, with the amount of connected horsepower. So we've tried to balance out the components that we'd be using here as well as the um, um, connections and so forth to accommodate rather large and high horsepowers to provide the torques that these machines are noted for and, and can produce. And that concludes uh, the overall presentation on the Mountaineer 2. And I wanted to thank everybody for, for, for uh, coming and attending the webinar. Um, and um, we're now shipping uh, a couple more machines of the, uh, over to China there for, for, this for these coal applications here. So that's going to increase our fleet up to six. So we're expecting a lot of new things and, and uh, working on other types of developments to handle harder material and more tougher materials that uh, hopefully we're going to be releasing very soon. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than glad to uh, uh, try to answer them. And at this time, everybody's line has been taken off mute. Um, I've got a question. This, this is Steve Bernard. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just went off Steve today, Steve. Good afternoon. How are you? Great. Um, you know, I've I've gone through the sizers and I've I've gone up to a mine up in Vancouver and presented a gunlock double roll. Where where do we determine or where do you determine to go to a sizer or a gunlock double roll? Well, there's a couple of different things that we look into, Steve. Um with the gunlock machines what we do is we look at the maximum compressive strength of the material. That's going to dictate uh, basically on our series size of gun lock crusher that we would want to use. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So if let's say if, if they had a, a relatively high compressive strength, let's say 18,000 roughly, we would have to go to maybe a 4,000 series crusher. Mm-hmm. So based on the shaft sizes, bearing sizes, and connected horsepower, you know, to crush that larger, more harder material. So, what, but if they said we had a very low tonnage uh, requirement, that might give us a little bit of a, um, advantage with the sizer because of the fact that we wouldn't need such a large machine, a 4,000 series roll crusher, uh, to take and handle probably reasonably good-sized lumps with higher compressive strengths with the sizer. So what I'm kind of saying is that as we go up with the compressive strength, the sizer might be more good advantage. Well, mainly we're going to get into a coal versus coal installation. Question, you know, the coal versus coal, if we, if, if we have um, uh, just coal material, uh, then uh, and basically well, what might happen, you know, you'd have to look at the overall cost of the machine. Mm-hmm. You know, with the sizer, it's going to probably be about... Uh, you know, the, the the roll crusher is going to be about two thirds the, the cost of the of the um, sizer itself. Mm-hmm. So on an equal footing application, uh, you'd probably be able to the gunlock roll crusher would be more economical. And they do have tramp metal protection, which we don't have. We're direct drive. That um, is correct with, with the sizer. Yeah. yeah, that is correct. That's a limitation of the sizer itself. That. Uh, you know, there's there's a few techniques that our competition does offer, as far as opening up and trying to expel the piece of material, mm-hmm. and and then let it get fished out. But you know, if it gets jammed down in the machine, you're going to have difficulties getting it out. And uh, what we'd like to do is, you know, with with the uh, gunlock machine, just let it open up past that, and then and then be notified uh, one way or another that you've done some, you know, you've done some of that where, uh, you know, and you go on with your production. I see. Okay. And China is, is rather than in their coal uh, crushing uh, uh, double rolls, they're they're going for the sizer in many cases rather than a gunlock style roll crusher, right? That is correct. And, and a lot of you know a number of the, of the reasons that they've done that is you know they, they've uh, you know the contractors that we work with and, and the design institutes uh, there in China uh, are kind of have cut their teeth on the on the sizing type of machine, and mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a little bit of uh, you know of, of culture there from the standpoint of what machines they like to use and um, and, and you know things that they they, they really like to uh, uh, to work with. So that's one of the things there at this point in time that they look at and and, uh, and and would like to you know kind of carry on with. But it's kind of a cultural thing and and what the customers are used to working with. Like buying a Mercedes instead of a Buick over there. Sure. Okay. Uh, that's all I need to know. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Hey, this is Gary Rhodes. I have a question. Hi, Jerry. Yes, please. Uh, Gary. You Gary? had uh, the optional uh, torque limiting device. If they don't have that and something jams, what stops the machine? Is it like motor overcurrent or does something, uh, is there a shear pin or what breaks? Well, what, what normally what normally happens, um, sometimes we take and, and configure between the motor and the, um, the drive a fluid coupling. Uh, basically, once if you have a catastrophic jam, and the torque basically goes to infinity before any of the other components can even react because it's such a violent and and closing type of uh, jam, then then what happens is, yeah, uh, we'll have like a zero speed switch or motor overload uh, current would occur occur to take and shut the unit off. Um, That's the way that most of them work at this point in time. Something gets jammed in them, and we just try to use low enough high torque but low enough speeds uh, and robust enough couplings to allow the uh, the machine to, you know, to take these shocks. And that's just part of the, the sizer mentality or uh, the sizer mode of operation that, you know, it's a big, robust, direct-driven machine, but they do break. Everybody's machines do break. And if you get enough of these catastrophic um, uh, stoppages in the, in the machine, 
it's you know it's kind of pot luck you know we it, it, it is you know the gearboxes are pretty robust because they're all straight bore and they're you know all the gears are shrunk on but uh, you know, and that's what we try to do with the uh, independent link gear box is to have it, you know, pretty robust. We've got about eight inches of gear depth on there that we're shrinking on. So we, we're trying to make it as robust as we can. But realistically, if you want to have some protection that, let's say, once a month you jam violently, then, in fact, you know, you're, you're going to get more chances at that because you're not putting, you know, undue stress on certain components. Yeah, sure, certainly. Okay, thanks. Sure. But if there's anybody else uh, on the line there that has any other questions, I'd be more than glad to ask. Okay. Well, I've got somewhere to close at this point in time on the uh, on it. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining, and uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you.